There's no large scale system in modern society that teaches humans how to relate to themselves in a competent way, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually, in a healthy way, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. If you ever had anyone growing up who taught you how to do that, you were extremely fortunate. Most people never had this. They learned just from their culture and the stuff that culture fed them was a lot of BS and was extremely unhealthy. Our Western culture, for example, very deeply overvalues, I don't want to say the word overemphasizes, rational thought to the point of completely disconnecting from actual direct experience, emotion, sensation, and feeling, which is a huge blind spot within Western civilization that causes a lot of various problems and delusions and forms of illness and sickness. So in this video, I want to really teach you how to really build a high quality relationship to yourself and actually love yourself. And the entire term of self-love is so overused that it's completely meaningless at this point because it's been used over and over and over again by just about everyone to the point where it's just corny at this point. But in this video, I want to give you an actual guide for how do you actually love yourself in a lasting way that isn't based off of bullshit. <laughs> this video is going to be very grounded and very practical. And it's also going to give you some history and some context into how your psyche got to where it got to. So we got to start from your childhood. Growing up, we had to completely adapt to the context that we found ourselves in. We had to survive inside of it. So any kind of behavior, belief, thought, emotion, way of relating that didn't get you the love and approval that you needed from your parents, from authority figures, from teachers, from even friends. You basically had to start cutting off from it. You had to start casting it away into your shadow. And then not just that, but the existence of those things was scary because if those things exist inside of you and they, let's say, like come out, <laughs> that can threaten your survival now. So we repress it. We're afraid of it. We actually start projecting all that unconscious material onto other people and the world. And then we actually wire in this entire way of relating to ourselves, our feelings, our thoughts, other people, etc. So you can see that within the first 10 to 20 years of someone's life, this puts them into a very psychologically sick place, one of fragmentation, inner fragmentation, a lack of harmony within oneself. And then from this place, we basically are convinced that we know what the world is and how it works, right? Especially as we grow up, we're convinced that we understand life when in actuality, it's the complete opposite. We're very ignorant, we're very deluded, we're very sick. So a core aspect of actually really learning to love yourself is learning to embrace the parts of you that you once repressed, learning how to not deny their existence and deny this entire thing that I'm talking about learning how to bring them back into conscious attention and integrate them. Because without this, you can't even express yourself in, a, in an authentic and honest way. It simply doesn't happen because you're just fragmented and disassociated from all these parts of you. You literally cannot express yourself in a genuine way because you're always fighting and struggling against yourself because you do not allow these parts of you to express. You're afraid to do that. So a core part of even integrating that is learning to work with the fear of those very parts of us. <laughs> because of course, like I said, we actually begin to get afraid of them. And then even for that, we have to learn how do we relate to this kind of stuff in a different way, other than resisting, denying, fighting, and struggling against ourselves. So in essence, what we're doing here is we're investigating repressed material. We're investigating our fear of our own psyche. And we're investigating the very relationship that we actually have to ourselves. This is actual self-love. When you can actually master this stuff, what are you really doing? You're building a psychology that's capable of unconditionally embracing itself. You're building a being that is capable of allowing everything inside of it to simply exist without needing to control it or interfere with it or get its hands in there, change it, fix it. It's this 
full acceptance of oneself. Self-love. You're not judging yourself. You're not overanalyzing yourself. You're not criticizing yourself, perceiving parts of you to be problems and feelings to be problems. It's just this like gentle, nurturing awareness of oneself and this allowing of yourself to act spontaneously with what is happening in the moment. And not spontaneously in like a silly, idiotic way, but spontaneously kind of like a child. How, you know, when you were a child and there was that thing happening on the swing set, you got interested and you spontaneously decide to follow that interest. It's like you're bringing yourself back to a very pure and organic way of being. That's what I mean by spontaneous. It's not stupid. It's actually connected to the present experience. It's connected to oneself. It's simply less repressed. So we have to learn to shift how we relate to the parts of us that we repress. We have to learn how do we actually work with the fear of these parts of ourselves. We have to learn to work with those parts of ourselves as well. So there's a lot of various things that we can actually do. And I want to start by just cracking down on this one thing called resistance. Resistance is basically there's something happening in the moment and we're fighting and struggling against it. We don't want it to be existing in the moment. This one thing, this one mechanism keeps a lot of this stuff intact. The relationship we have to ourselves, the fear and all the parts of ourselves we repress. It keeps this whole thing intact. By minimizing resistance to what's happening inside of yourself, essentially you're allowing what is happening to happen. You're allowing what's happening inside of you to exist without... I thought there was a cat or something behind me. There's a lot of cats in this neighborhood. <laughs> you're allowing what's happening inside of you to exist without needing to get so involved in it. You're allowing what's happening inside of you to arise, exist for how long it wants to exist for, and then pass away. It's actually the most loving way of relating to yourself. You don't have to fix yourself, change yourself, do anything. It's just this full embrace of who you are right now, just by minimizing resistance. And we have so much conditioning that has been wired over time to resist ourselves that this becomes quite tricky. That's why this is a long-term development. This isn't a five-minute solution. This is like a long-term vision for your life of who you want to be. So without actually having a daily mindfulness meditation practice, this is near impossible. <laughs> There's no way around this one. You need some kind of structured time to actually be meditating and watching yourself. Because really, what is meditation? Meditation is just self-observation. Meditation is just watching yourself. Right? If I want to branch on that a little bit more, watching, feeling, and learning to just surrender to what's happening. Untense the body, relax the body, allow it to open up. Allow the flow of feeling and sensation and thought to arise, exist, and then pass. So it's like you have to be in an undistracted environment and actually give yourself the attention awareness that you actually need and you actually need it. Without this awareness, your body's always tense. You're resisting, you're struggling, you're fighting. You're actually creating a lot of unnecessary suffering for yourself just by how you are relating to your experience. And meditation is allowing you to observe how you relate to your experience. I speak to... A lot of people in my one-to-one -one coaching, done quite a lot of calls with people. Meditation is not walking, right? There's walking meditation, but <laughs> meditation is not um, just going out into nature. Although like all that stuff is great. There has to be an actual dedicated time to sitting, totally undistracted, seeing, feeling, and just surrendering allowing the muscles in the body to relax, allowing the tension in the body to just relax. And we have to actually sharpen our mindfulness muscles so that we can bring it into the midst of everyday life so that we don't just always be go unconscious over and over and over again. We have to learn how to bring mindfulness into our everyday life because everyday life is essentially triggering various parts of your psyche that need to be looked at. Your career triggers certain parts of your psyche. Your relationship triggers a lot of parts of your psyche. 
Your relationship to food triggers a lot of parts of your psyche. Your relationship to entertainment triggers a lot of parts of your psyche. Your relationship to this video is triggering parts of your psyche. Everything that you're interacting with is triggering various parts of you. It's like turning them on, making them behave in certain ways. And you have to apply mindful attention to them. Not thought, not just analysis. <laughs> Awareness, just watching without judgment, just observing. Because a lot of people can hear my videos and then they start overanalyzing their experience. I got to get the why do I feel this way and why. And it's like this whole conceptual matrix that gets formed, which is fine. Like there's value in it. I'm not saying to never do that, but you need to develop this capacity to just sit and exist, to sit and be, to sit and watch and feel and surrender into the present. Next, there's this core element that without understanding this is going to be really really hard to be well energy basically gets stored in the body if you want some bonus uh, resources to check out for this you can check out the body keeps the score trauma and the unbound, unbound body a lot of the work of judith blackstone highlights a lot of the stuff like very well also toward a psychology of awakening by john wellwood highlights this stuff very well but basically, ener energy stores in the body. Repressed emotions, feelings, parts, energies, sensations get stored in the body. They cause a bunch of dysregulations in the nervous system. It keeps you in fight, flight, freeze. We'll be talking about the nervous system very shortly. But you need to actually make your body an alive and vital place. You have to eat food that actually makes you feel energized, makes you feel light and clear and sharp. Right? Cutting out junk food. Typically, this means eating a lot of fruit and vegetables for uh, your, your average person. But of course, I'm gonna urge you to not listen to me on what you should eat, but listen to your body. Listen to what the impulses and needs of your body are above any particular diet, advice, or ideology. But generally this means hydrating well, right? Not having a lot of soda or pop or whatever the hell you wanna call it. <laughs> Learning to heavy metal detox, right? Our body accumulates heavy metals, they get stuck in our organs and you have to learn to detox them or else they just stay there and they actually affect your psychology and your emotions and your development. Right? You have to exercise, do yoga, stretch. Can you touch your toes? And you have to ensure that your body is a flexible place to be because your body and your mind are inseparate. There's no distinction. There's no boundary separating them at all. By working on your body, you actually work on your mind. Is your body strong? So by making it this vital alive place, it's easier to feel into it. It's easier to be grounded inside of it. It's easier to actually process emotions. You need forces, a flow of energy to be moving through your body. Right? By making it healthy, it's easier for energy to flow through your body. By meditating and applying awareness to the body, it's easier for, aware or for energy to flow through the body. Right? Applying awareness, feeling, and then just relaxing it. You're allowing the re pattern of repressing and contracting and tensing, right? You're bringing awareness to that pattern and then it eases up over time. So moving on to the nervous system, when we're in this habitual unregulated state, we're always in fight, flight, freeze. The parts of us that need to be integrated, they actually cannot come out when the nervous system is just stuck in deep states of fight, flight, freeze. And we need ways of bringing the nervous system into a regulated state so that these unregul unregulated parts can emerge. There has to be a certain amount of safety occurring within us, a sense of safety occurring within us, so that these parts that feel so unsafe can begin to arise. And then they will trigger dysregulations in the nervous system as well that we have to work through. So I highly recommend looking into regulating the nervous system. I have some pretty good books on my book list. I believe there's a good book. I think it's called Anchored by Deb, Deb Dana, D-E-B-D-A-N-A -A, maybe. That's a pretty good one. But it's some good ways to regulate the nervous system are just by stretching, breathing exercises. A lot of the stuff that I was mentioning, breathing deep into your gut rather than shallow into the upper chest not always being distracted by phones and screens. When you're always stuck on screen addictions, 
you're actually in an unregulated state. This actually messes up your nervous system. If you're always overstimulated, your nervous system isn't regulated. Eating healthy foods, like I said, exercising, weightlifting, connecting with people, right? making sure you actually get the connection you need, making sure you get the alone time that you need. Reading a lot of books on this stuff helps you. You need to actually fill your mind up with the high quality information that it needs so it can make sense of all this confusing phenomena. And also ideas hold energy to them. Ideas operate at certain levels of consciousness. By having a lot of high quality, high conscious ideas, this shapes you up over time. If you don't believe me, just read 200 books and see what happens to your life and your mind and how you relate to yourself. So essentially everything that we're doing here is so that we can become more conscious and aware of ourselves. It's so that we can feel more connected to the full spectrum of ourselves, though repressing, denying, judging, criticizing, evaluating. Essentially, we're getting to the point where we can just be. We can just exist. And we feel safe allowing every single aspect of ourselves to exist. Every aspect of ourselves arises within a safe container, which is our own awareness. And then it passes away into awareness once again. That's it for this video. If you want to work with me one-to-one, -one, you can apply to do so. Link is in the pinned comment. Take it easy.